The following is a holiday replay episode. This podcast is made possible by Vena. Hi, this is Akash Palkiwala. I'm CFO of Qualcomm, and you're listening to CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 754. When, the, when we were forced to close all 2,000 plus locations in March of 2020, revenues went to zero. And unlike restaurants, unlike retail, you know, we didn't have drive through. We didn't have takeout. We didn't have online sales because if the, if the gyms aren't open, we're not billing members. And so we took it upon ourselves to contact the lenders who lend into many of our franchisees to really help them uh, understand where we were, uh, understand that, you know, we were going to come out of this on the other side at some point. Hey, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Tom Fitzgerald, CFO of Planet Fitness. Back in the mid-1990s, before email became widely used across corporate America, the management of Frito-Lay's Northern California region suddenly began receiving letters from different unit leaders across the management ranks of parent company PepsiCo. What's going on in Northern California was the question top of mind across Pepsi's regional sales organizations. At the time, Tom Fitzgerald was a relatively new arrival inside the finance department for Frito-Lay Northern California, a geography that when it came to sales performance had in recent years become known as a bottom dweller. That be it as it may, the region was suddenly enjoying some impressive numbers. As finance leader Fitzgerald tells us, new top line metrics and incentives were unquestionably all part of the turnaround mix. But the real cure for Frito-Lay's bottom dwelling ways, Fitzgerald says, boils down to a single word, focus. It was an answer Fitzgerald's Pepsi colleagues no doubt digested with some degree of skepticism. But as the finance leader explains, it was exactly the medicine Frito-Lay California needed most. Tom Fitzgerald shares that story and much more after this. Managing multiple spreadsheets, disconnected data, numbers you just can't trust. Your finance team can't be the strategic partner your organization needs right now with obstacles like that getting in your way. Vena can change that. Vena brings people, processes, and systems together in a single collaborative analytical platform so you can drive connected business planning and better decision making. And it's the only native Excel complete planning platform built for Microsoft 365 with Power BI embedded. With Vena, your financial and operational data is always connected and your teams are always armed with insights and time to focus on what matters most. So when the stakes are high and the margin for error low, plan with agility, plan with resilience, plan with Vena, so you can be prepared for whatever comes next. Visit venasolutions.com slash planning aces to learn more about how Vena will help you plan for anything. We're speaking with Tom Fitzgerald, CFO of Planet Fitness. Tom, welcome. Thanks, Jack. Great to be with you. So, Tom, we always begin by asking our guests to look back and trying to identify some of those experiences they feel they feel prepared them for a finance leadership role. What would come to mind for you? Yeah, sure thing, Jack. So I think, you know, I I, I count myself as being very fortunate. You know, I spent the first 22 years of my career with um, a couple of academy companies, PepsiCo and Consumer Products. And then I joined Bath & Body Works, which was part of Limited Brands, which was known as, you know, really great retailer, I think still is. 
um, and and then I got into restaurants, and then now at Planet Fitness. So I think, you know, the maybe the common threads there a little bit. Great brands, you know, some really great brands along the way. Um, great talent and leaders who I got to work with, and frankly, stole shamelessly from. Um, and particularly at PepsiCo, there are many things that that we did at PepsiCo back in the day that I still. Uh, I still sort of employ and put in practice. Uh, they just they just did a lot of things well. But importantly, you know what what I also learned along the way is, you know, getting a lot of responsibility sometimes maybe before you were fully ready for it, and having uh, an expectation to have an impact on the business, right? So it wasn't just about keeping the score; you were um, uh, expected to change the score and help the business both in the short term and the long term. So. You know, that's always carried uh, forward with me. Um, and I think particularly at PepsiCo, where they really viewed finance uh, finance leaders who were the business unit leader in finance to be the co-general manager. So it wasn't just about the numbers. It was about working with the team, finding ways, you know, whether it was the soda business with Pepsi or the snack business with Frito-Lay and all of the different brands we had there to really, you know, not only drive performance, but put some distance between us and the competitor. So I love being in consumer facing brands, uh, particularly multi-unit or, you know, in the case of PepsiCo with a direct store delivery business where there are lots of people that you can align on some uh, uh, important initiatives to really drive performance. So, you know, and, and fortunately now here at Planet Fitness, it's a, it's a tremendous brand uh, very uniquely positioned in the industry and um, just super excited to have joined them now almost two years ago. Now you got a, uh, you got an MBA along the way and uh, you were at Pepsi at the time. Yes, I did. I actually, uh, I, I joined Pepsi right out of college um, and then got my MBA at night uh, while also working. So, um, you know, I was fortunate to be able to do that. And I think it really helped me both, you know, sort of have some practical experience that I was, uh, uh, you know, able to take to the classroom at night, if you will, and, and, and at least have some experience to balance out the academic learning that I was getting. Uh, you shared with us how Pepsi played an important role here, I guess, in how to partner with the business and understand the dynamics. You leave and you become a, a vice president of finance on the next role. Is that right? As you join uh, Bath and Body Works? Yeah, well, I joined as uh, as the CFO, so it was uh, it was part of a larger corporation. They had multiple brands at the time. Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works were the two largest, but they had several others. And um, you know, it was really an interesting time because they were trying to transform the business from um, what they would describe it as, what the founder would describe it as, knockoff design and speed sourcing, which was really the apparel model, right? They had they had private planes uh, before most people did. Uh, they would, you know, literally fly to um, fly to Europe to see the fashion shows uh, in 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 one of the corporate planes, and then continue on from there with pictures of the fashion show over to Hong Kong to source the goods immediately and basically knock it off. So the old story was, um, you know, they had the Dolce and Gabbana like uh, Python pants that were on the runway in the express stores before Dolce & Gabbana ever had it in um, in their own stores. Now, it was faux python <laughs> at a fraction of the cost, but that whole notion of moving from knockoff design speed sourcing to building uh, world-class brands, they did, interestingly enough, the first thing that the founder did, talking to Jack Welsh, I heard the story many times, talking to Jack Welsh and uh, Tishy from GE and, and others, was to go get consumer products CFOs. And the reason was because he felt, this guy, Les Wexner, felt that the the current retail CFOs tended to be more of the green eye shade profile, you know, more more interested in in the in the in the purchase order in the in the in the current season and not always able to take a longer view of the business and balance the short-term decisions with the longer-term strategic decisions. And his counsel was to, you know, find CFOs from consumer products who, you know, probably had a better sense of working with, you know, brands that, that, that were, um, uh, you know, multi-decade in their, in their, in their, uh, in their longevity. So I was actually hired by the corporate CFO who I had worked with at PepsiCo. 
And it turned out many of the uh, of my colleagues in other CFO positions I had worked with at PepsiCo. Um, and I think, you know, some of the decisions, frankly, that we came upon there uh, 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 were a testament to the fact that I think he made the right decision because in our own case, just to continue on that one, um, at Bath & Body Works, we had told the street before, you know, a couple years before I got there that we were going to add 200 new stores a year every year. And we had a couple thousand stores. Um, and when you would see some of the locations that we would go into, they weren't really brand accretive. You could argue they were brand damaging. You know, we were, we were going to be around some pretty awful looking um, stores and given centers. And the real estate team, I remember asking the question being there not very long. You know, I said that that site looks brand damaging. And they said, well, if you're going to have 4,000 stores, you're going to be in sites like that. So uh, we ended up doing some work, some strategic work that said we shouldn't probably have that many stores um, and we should probably rethink our whole strategy. And that ultimately led to a turnaround of the business because the, you know, the brand was struggling. And I think that notion of doing the same thing over and over again was ultimately going to get us in trouble. And we had to rethink the strategy. And I think having that ability to step back and ask the broader question didn't necessarily have the answer, just, you know, asking the question is is maybe uh, a testament to that notion that you wanted somebody who had a longer horizon uh, on their decision making. Now, I just want to mention you were a CFO of Bath and Body Works for six years, and you uh, have a number of other CFO tours of duty uh, within your bio. Uh, some are in the apparel industry, some are not. Uh, you're also a chief operating officer. You also had a stint as a chief administration officer. So there's a variety of different roles and and industries. Actually, you're you're pretty diversified. Yeah, it, it's a it's true. And and I and I think you know uh, someone once told me it's not a really a career path. It's a career journey. And I think at the end of the day, it's about the collection of experiences, the tools you ultimately put in your toolkit. And by seeing different businesses, really in, in, in Pepsi too, I, I was in a number of different business units. That's how they develop leaders. And I was fortunate to be part of that program. You know, you're really sort of, you're, you're expected to come into a business, learn it pretty quickly, learn sort of what matters and what doesn't, because oftentimes you can get bogged down in the things that don't really matter. And, and, and as I said earlier, have an impact. So I think seeing these different businesses and different industries and, um, you know, uh, I guess allowed me just by experience to develop some pattern recognition skills, for lack of a better term. And you start to say, well, maybe that's a that's similar to what I saw somewhere else before. It's a little bit different, but maybe again by asking a few questions and 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 trying to learn the uh, as much about the business as quickly as I could, and and developing partnerships with the leaders, you really end up where um, hopefully that set of fresh eyes that comes into the business and and understands it enough to ask the questions that maybe stimulate some other um, other work, other analysis, other research might ultimately lead to a better business decision, I think was what helped me and helped those businesses along the way. Well, I have to say some of our best conversations uh, with finance leaders have been uh, how they found their way through some of the economic turbulence during the, the course of building their careers. And we've spoken to CFOs who, uh, back in the dot-com uh, days, uh, experienced that dot-com implosion and had to uh, ha you know do large layoffs or even lose their companies. And we've spoken with, of course, finance executives who are on Wall Street during the downturn. And uh, I have to say, you uh, enter the CFO office at Planet uh, fitness in January of 2020 on the eve of COVID. And of course, it's retail. Uh, there's nothing uh, that could compare to this. And again, it's something you had to deal with front and center upon your arrival. It, it's very true. And it, you know, what was interesting, it, it, just a little bit of background on Planet Fitness, it's, um, it, it's, it's a very disruptive brand. You know, many people say, uh, the essence of strategy is being differentiated. We're differentiated to the point of being disruptive. Um, and I think the key measure for that is in 2018 and 2019, before the pandemic, 
if you look at the industry stats from our trade association, we accounted for more than 100% of the member growth in the entire industry uh, across the US, just amazing. And our share is about 20%. So it just gives you a sense of how disruptive it is. And, and ultimately, um, uh, we just do things very differently than the rest of the industry. And we were on a, on a high, we were on a roll. We had the most new store openings in 2019 that we had in our history, 261. Um, we had 2,000 2, stores. And then, yeah, I joined um, uh, in, in March, all of the stores shut down. And, uh, you know, no one was prepared for that. And no one had seen anything like that. And unlike restaurants, unlike retail, you know, we didn't have drive through. We didn't have takeout. We didn't have online sales. When, the, when we were forced to close all 2,000 plus locations, in March of 2020, revenues went to zero because if the stores are, if the gyms aren't open, if the stores, you know, we're not billing members. And in some cases, like in California, they only build their, the, our, our, our franchisees only build members uh, three out of the 12 months in 2020. So imagine going nine months without billing, you know, without any revenue. And I had been in a business uh, with PepsiCo affiliated with a business that that we uh, did through a joint venture with General Mills in Europe, in France, where they, in shortly after we started running it, a large retailer kicked us out, kicked, kicked the brand out. And overnight, they lost 25% of the revenue, which was staggering. As, as tough as that was, it was, it would have been a walk in the park compared to, you know, revenues going to zero. So it was just, it was just such a trying time, you know, for the country. Everybody was panicking. No one knew how long things would last, and we were fortunate to be um, to have a lot of a, a lot of cash on the balance sheet, and to be able, as the franchisor, to um, pull back on some of our expenses, reduce our cash burn, so that we had enough liquidity to last us for a very long time. If stores, in fact remained closed and our revenue stayed at zero. Um, as well, you know, our franchisees were kind of panicky, you know, as, as was everybody. And so we took it upon ourselves to contact the lenders who lend into many of our franchisees to really help them uh, understand where we were, uh, understand that, you know, we were gonna come out of this on the other side at some point. And in a very highly fragmented industry, we would likely be stronger on the other side uh, than when we came in. As, as wide as our competitive moat was coming in, it was likely going to get wider. And sure enough, it played out. Unfortunately, the industry was just ransacked by the pandemic. The Trade Association has said that 22% of the over 40,000 gyms in America have permanently closed. So that's 9,000 gyms have permanently closed um, as a result of the pandemic. Now we had zero closed during that time frame. And the reason is because the model is so profitable. Um, our franchisees have made so much money over the years, much of which they've reinvested back in the business to grow it. But they were themselves well capitalized enough that in the case that I mentioned in, in California, where the franchisees only collected revenues nine out of 12 months, they were able to withstand it. Um, so it's really a testament to the strength of the business how well capitalized and, and great operators our franchisees are that in an industry that was really devastated, we were able to come out with zero closures and ultimately a, a wider com com uh, a wider competitive moat um, once this is behind us. In the, in the depths of it all, uh, your scenario planning, there was, uh, there was three plans. One was the upbeat. We're going to pull out of this and everything will return to normal. B was something in the middle and, and uh, C was a, a very negative plan. Uh, no, what would you what would you share with us as you tried to navigate out of this? There must have been some scenario planning with your team. You must have had discussions over all sorts of possibilities. Yeah, we sure did. And in fact, um, we have a saying here of one team, one planet. We view ourselves and our franchisees as one entity. It's not it's not combative. And in my uh, a couple of my stints, we uh, we were in a franchise business, and it is it is unlike the relationship I've ever seen between franchisor and franchisee. So we took some pain ourselves, you know, to alleviate the uh, some of the commitments they had as it relates to new store development, 
and, and other CapEx requirements so that we could relieve the pressure from the conversations they would have with their lenders. And we initially, you know, thought we gave a 12 month extension back to your question about timing and just said, let's just take that issue off the table. It was a long term view. One of the many reasons I love working with founders as CEOs is because they tend to balance much better than non founders in my judgment. Um, and I've worked now with seven founders. They're better able to judge to, to, to juggle the long term and the short term demands of you know, being a public company. And so I think we really, I, I, what I would say, Jack, is we um, we took steps with our own cash burn and with our uh, accommodations to our franchisees that if this was gonna last a while, we would be fine. And, and, if it, and, then, and then if it was shorter in duration, it would just be upside. But we didn't wanna continue to revisit the decisions and continue to have to adjust our timelines. And thankfully, as we just reported our Q3 results, the, the, the recovery, once the nation started to get vaccinated, our results really started to improve through Q2 and into Q3. And, and thankfully, the recovery looks more V-shaped than U-shaped, uh, which has, has caused us to um, you know, just have tremendous momentum uh, coming here into the fourth quarter and headed into January and Q1, which is really our big season as people you know, make the New Year's resolutions and really start to take care of themselves. And, and our membership is back, has bounced back to we're, we're at 97 percent of where we were pre uh, pre pandemic. So, you know, we feel good about that, again, uh, particularly based on what's happened in the industry. Now, uh, for those listeners who might not be familiar with the business model, is Planet Fitness serve its its members differently from other fitness franchisers uh is it is it is there something unique there in terms of how they whether it's an annual membership or however it works yeah it's a great question and i'll actually start with who we target so uh, I, it, it's funny i joke with the team we're the opposite brain if you take everything most fitness brands do in the industry we do the opposite and it starts with who we target so most fitness brands and i used to belong to lifetime fitness before i came to planet you know they target people who uh are already, uh, you know, uh, uh, members of a gym. That's about 20% of the U.S. population belongs to a gym. And that's pretty similar in other, uh, other developed countries around the world, 15 to 20%. So the vast majority do not belong to a gym. So everybody, you know, Lifetime Fitness, Crunch, Blink, you name your, your uh, uh, LA Fitness, they really target people who belong to a gym. We target the other 80%. We say we're trying to get people off the couch to start their fitness journey. That is why we have a $10 price point, and we've had $10 for over two decades as our opening uh, membership price point, which is about 40% of our members. But as a former retailer, I love this. And, and, and as a retailer, we would have killed to have this stat. We have two price points, essentially, Jack. We have a $10 price point and a $22.99 monthly uh, dues price point that gives you a whole lot of other uh, perks and amenities. So we almost always uh, advertise the $10 price point. Yet six out of 10 people who come in to join for $10 walk out with the $22.99 price point, which is amazing, right? Every, it's it's the old, you know, uh, uh, loss leader kind of thing, but it's not a loss leader for us. But more than, uh, more than 60% of the people walk in thinking they're going to spend 10 and spend more than double. And that's just because of the value that we offer. And so, you know, in, in doing that, by attracting people who are on the couch to start their fitness journey, we often, we do the other thing that uh, is opposite the industry. We make it very easy to cancel because we know that life may get in the way, you know, kids soccer games or, you know, whatever is going on. And you just, aren't getting to the gym, so you're gonna cancel your membership. That's fine because typically 20% and here more recently, 30% of the people joining Planet Fitness have belonged to Planet Fitness at some point in the past. And so that's just, again, how we think about our business and how who we target and why we're able to, I think, account for more than 100% of the membership growth in the US because we're bringing people into fitness, not trying to steal share 
And I spent my career at Pepsi between Pepsi and Coke and Frito and and Eagle Snacks back in the day and 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 all the regional brands trying to steal share. This is a whole different ball game. And so we do. We charge people um, uh, a monthly fee back to your original question. And there's an annual fee that goes along with that. But when you look at it, uh, what we what you can get for ten dollars is essentially the same equipment I was working out on at Lifetime Fitness, and I was paying eighty bucks a month. So it's just a tremendous value that uh, you know allows us to um, continue to grow and continue to bring people off the couch. And I'd say the other thing is gyms are intimidating. You know, when I go into Lifetime, whether it was my first visit or my hundredth visit, I'm intimidated. You know. People are in there banging weights around and grunting and flexing in the mirror. And, you know, for somebody who's never been in a gym, that's pretty intimidating. And so we like to think about it as we break down the barriers to get people off the couch. It's a judgment-free zone. We have weights that only go up to 75 pounds. So if you're looking for the big weights to throw around, it's we're, we're not your place. We actually even have a lunk alarm. So if you see somebody banging weights and grunting, you can go over to this little switch and throw it. And this, this alarm goes off called the lunk alarm that, you know, we just have fun with and, and, and um, try to calm people down from getting too, too intense about it because that becomes intimidating. We want it to be judgment free. We don't care what you look like. You don't have to get in shape to join the gym. Just come on in and start your fitness journey. And we think given what's happened to the country and their psyche, and people um, just having a lot of mental wellness pressure on them because of the pandemic. You know, we think fitness is a great way to help alleviate some of the stress and the anxiety that we've all felt with the pandemic. And it's really not about the vanity of, of getting six packs or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's really about taking care of yourself and, and that judgment-free, non-intimidating environment at a tremendous price point. You know, many companies I've been with, we really try to struggle with what's our moral purpose. And you, you have to concoct something that doesn't really relate to what you do. The core of what we do is our moral purpose, trying to help America get uh, a, a little healthier um, and, and to start their fitness journey. And the last thing I'd say is we're really proud of the fact that 25% of our stores are in areas that the government would deem low income. Now, you and I know that those 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 neighborhoods typically are food deserts. You know, they're chock full of uh, fast food restaurants and not a lot of healthy choices. So we love the fact, and our franchisees love the fact that we're able to bring a very healthy, a very affordable alternative to those neighborhoods to help people, you know, live a healthier lifestyle. Curious when you uh, were recruited perhaps, or when you were thinking about joining the company and wonder, did you spend any time with the uh, franchisees? I always think it's interesting. Uh, you're the CFO of the franchisor. You have your lines of sight. And then there's uh, the the people right on the premises with their lines of sight. And I would imagine Planet uh, Fitness has a dashboard or, or has tools that, of course, the franchisees can use. Or how can you can you share some of what how that works with us? Yeah, sure thing. So we, uh, you're right. We have, uh, you know, kind of a data platform that all the all of the membership information flows through, and franchisees can access that. They can also use um, uh, one of our uh, strategic partners tool to to access the information they need. Um, and you know, one of the beauties of this business, uh, Jack, is the simplicity of it. You know, there there aren't that many moving parts. Back to your question about competitors, you know, many of them have trainers and uh, you, you buy training packages, they have daycare, they have salons. We don't. 98% of our revenue comes from membership dues. So there aren't that many moving parts. There's not that, there, there aren't that many things to look at, but we do. We provide a dashboard to them. Uh, we also have franchise business coaches that work with our franchisees to you know, help um, improve the execution of key initiatives that we've got going on. Um, so we really see ourselves as supporting what is 95% of our stores are franchisee owned and operated. We only, we only own and operate 5% of our stores ourselves. So um, it's, it's just a great partnership, but we, you know, we always have their interest in mind because anything we can do to improve their operations and their visibility into important information, we can use ourselves. Um, 
back to that sort of one team, one planet concept that we had. So the, the top of mind metrics for you, and I think you've already shared some of these, it's, it's, um, you, you actually can determine how your, your franchisees, how they're performing, whether stores, the health of the given franchisee, whether they're uh, acquiring new customers, all of this, I would imagine is visible to you. It is. It, it absolutely is. And I'd say, you know, one of the things we're really excited about, we spend about a quarter of a billion dollars as a system on marketing. And we have used our scale across many things except marketing until now. So our franchisees across the system, we have about 120, fran 25 franchisees. Collectively, they were using 16 diff different ad agencies across the country. And we spend about 9% of monthly member dues on marketing. So it's a, it's a pretty big uh, investment. We've now, uh, we recently announced a move to one agency Publicis, who's one of the largest in the world, they buy one out of every three media dollars in the U.S. And now we're bringing all of that collective spend under one roof. So there's tremendous scale opportunities. And basically, we're going to spend the same money, but it's going to go a whole lot further in terms of buying GRPs, TRPs, eyeballs, whatever metric you want to use, that ultimately will drive more more uh, uh, more member acquisition. And one of the beauties of this model, the, the, the profitability is just very strong. We've said publicly that a typical mature store, once it's a couple of years old, will earn uh, EBITDA margins in the high 30, low 40% range. And many, many of them start with a five. So when you think about, you know, I saw Chipotle a couple of quarters ago, they re released their earnings and I know they're not franchised, but it's a multi-unit, you know, terrific brand. And they were at an all-time high four-wall EBITDA margins of 25%. And here we are, you know, well above that. So it's just, it's just such a strong model. But that notion that we can drive that many more joins and the fact that, you know, one of the great metrics, we don't disclose this publicly, but the lifetime value of a customer, uh, compared to the cost of acquiring a customer, that gap is, is enormous. So the more we can do to drive more new members into the brand and this, this, this agency consolidation will ultimately make that even more efficient. So it's just, it's just gonna propel us going forward and we're super excited about it as are our franchisees, um, as we are, are probably 70% of, of our way through this transition as we speak. I'm just curious about your team now at corporate. Is there a, is there an FP and a team? Have you built that out uh, given these uh, the unique span of time that you you've been a CFO at Planet Fitness? Yeah, sure thing. And I I, um, I was very fortunate the the former CFO was promoted to president, so I was able to step into the role he vacated, and he's still here with us. He's a terrific leader, Dorvin Lively, and and he built a really strong team. And I think. You know, when I walked in a couple of years ago, the accounting team was in great shape. The FP&A team, I think, had served the business well. Um, but like, you know, like many things, the business grew very quickly. And some of the the um, the processes and things that the team was working on were probably no longer needed. And we needed to pivot to be a little bit stronger on the business partner side, a little more agile on the on the um, on the turnaround time of some of the some of the requests and insights. And, you know, that's a big part of, 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 I think, how we add value to the business and really helping with fact-based decisions and really kind of measuring, you know, how much, how much risk, how much impact is going, is, is involved in a given um, endeavor and really balancing that. And so I think we've made some changes in the FP&A team. They, um, to, 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 you know, sort of stop doing the work that we probably no longer needed and focus on the work that was really going to have value and drive impact. You know, one of the things that I go back to in my PepsiCo uh, days, they had a, a way of thinking about change that has stayed with me. And, you know, someone once said, you can put everything on, you can put anything on a two by two matrix, right? And this matrix would be on, on one axis would be the amount of change from low to high. And the other axis would be the size of the thing you're changing. And the, uh, it, it was so instilled in us, I can almost so, still recite it verbatim. But the idea was small changes to small things are a waste of time, you know, and uh, uh, small changes to big things are good. Sort of a continuous improvement, you know, always a good thing. Big changes to small things are will, will result in the illusion of progress. So you think you're doing a big thing, but it's really not going to have an impact. 
And big changes to big things, that's really what moves the needle and drives performance. And that was instilled in us. And I think, you know, back to the FP&A thing, I've really, you know, in working with the team directly, it's a terrific team, really trying to focus on the things that can really move the needle. Yes, we have to do the planning. Yes, we have to do the forecasting and all the things. But let's do them in a way that really matters, That in a way that our business partners really understand the key levers. And then let's spend the rest of the time helping them drive better business insights and better, ultimately better business performance. So um, that's just one way I think uh, that I've thought about change, whether it's been to your question about FP&A, whether it's been about, uh, you know, in different retail brands where we were in the midst of a turnaround where everything seems important, but you really have to pick a few important things to move in a dramatic way. Otherwise, the customer just won't see it and you ultimately won't turn the business around. We've been asking uh, finance leaders lately about, uh, and, and I think uh, you just touched on this in some way, uh, agility in decision making, uh, you know, supplying the information out there so you can influence the decision making of the larger organization in the right fashion, in the right way. Um, in a franchise organization, it's almost like your business partners influencing their decision making in the right way by sharing certain numbers that perhaps are enlightening them. In, to, to trends or opportunities. I don't know. Uh, but do you see that as a, obviously it's a central role that you play. Do, is it or no? No, it is. It's, it's very true. And I think, you know, that notion that sometimes the leader just wants a quick answer and they want it to be close enough. And other times you need a lot of precision because it's a big investment or it's an important decision. And I think being able to sort that is important. And I'd also say, you know, one of the things that I try to emphasize with with the FP&A team is, you know, what percent of our time are we working on demand or top line related things? And what percent of the time are we working on cost related things? And I think typically finance has spent too much time, not here, but anywhere, too much time on the cost related things. But ultimately, if the top line isn't moving in a way that is, uh, you know, accelerating and sustainable, then you can't cut enough costs to offset that, right? So I think, I think the notion that we want to spend time on helping the business see what matters, and, and I'll give you a good example. You know, through the pandemic, we lost membership. Uh, our membership public, this is public knowledge, it went from 15 and a half million in March of 2020, and we ended the year uh, at 13 and a half million. And we'd never seen a membership decline. It had all, only grown. And so one of the things we thought about for 2021 is how do we how do we rebuild that membership level? And so one of the things that I we challenged ourselves to do was, given what I said earlier about the cost per member acquisition is so much lower than the lifetime value, the more we spent, the more we would make. But we kind of viewed the, the marketing spend as a bit of a, a ceiling, if you will, and not a floor. So we we, we encouraged our own corporate store team to, with some facts, with some quick analysis, to spend more money as a way to rebuild in marketing, to acquire more customers, to more quickly rebuild the membership back than we would otherwise. And we did the same with our franchisees. And to your point, that didn't take, you know, a lot of analysis. We, we got the right information on a couple of pages in front of people so they understood it, could digest it, and then execute it. And that's really... That's the, that's the jazz of the job, right? You really want to be able to help people make better decisions and then help them execute it in a way. And you can see the, you can see the tote board moving <laughs> as the results get better. And so, you know, I think that now there are times where costs matter and you got to really focus on cost. But I like to think that really good finance people spend 60 to 70 percent of their time on top line related activity and the balance on cost. We always like to ask finance leaders, particularly uh, following COVID here, uh, about talent in the workforce and whether uh, this great resignation that we've been hearing about is likely to impact their business. I don't know if Planet Fitness is doing a good deal of hiring these days, but what would you tell us about the great resignation and whether it's changed how uh, your mindset as a finance leader when it comes to talent? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it is. Uh... It is a challenge for all businesses, I think, and we're not unique. I think one of the interesting things about our business is, as I was talking about, just 
the, the nature of what we do is, uh, I think, just makes people feel good about what we do. You know, we're not we're not making things that if you eat them, you're probably going to get uh, you're you're you're, you're going to um, reduce your health uh, in a way or hurt. You know, uh, um, you know, you could probably edit that out. I didn't say that quite right, but you know, we're we're doing things that help people. We don't sell things that may make you less healthy, and so I think that's a that's a draw. But I think there is pressure for sure. Uh, across the entire headquarters team and finance is not immune. But I would say if you want to work in a, in a consumer facing brand that does good things, has tremendous growth opportunities and all of the things I mentioned earlier, this is a pretty, this is a pretty great place. And so, but I think the, the, the idea of how do you select that talent so that uh, we don't have a mismatch and, you know, the, the whole interview selection process is always a challenging thing. And, you know, I've always thought about it as I want to look for things that we can't train because everything else we can teach you or train you, but we can't teach you to be curious, right? We can't teach you to be driven and we can't teach you to work well with people and want to be around people. Everything else we can kind of train. Um, and so if we find that in people, um, then I, then I think we've got a much better chance of, of filling the role with somebody who's not only going to be able to do that role, but hopefully grow and develop, uh, you know, with us for many, many years. And that's really one of the things that, that, I'm, that, that I always get um, a lot of satisfaction out of is seeing people grow and develop, take on more responsibility within the team, maybe more than they ever thought they could, and shining. And that's part of my training at PepsiCo, I think, you know, that sort of people development aspect of it. And and I was given more responsibility, as I said earlier, probably before I was ready in many cases. And I try to do that with people, too, because that's how you really learn and grow and get stretched. And that's what you remember. You, you may have to do some, some less um, value-added work along the way, but if it's mixed with some really interesting stretch assignments, then that's a really good way to retain people in a way that a few extra dollars in their paycheck may not. Well, we always like to ask for a finance strategic moment, and this could have been any time during the course of your career where your lines of sight into the organization allowed you to see an opportunity. Maybe you saw a risk and you, you're able to move the organization away from acquiring too much risk. Whatever it may have been, what comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Yeah, I'll give you. It's it's a little bit uh, from the past, but it's it's one that I I still reflect upon. Um, so uh, just to to set the context, I was working in Frito Lay uh, and um, was part of the Western Division, which included California. And there were and uh, and ultimately, I went from um, that role into the business unit of Northern California. So I knew the leader. And Northern California, oddly enough, was the only unionized market for Frito in the country. Uh, we had a direct have a direct had a direct store delivery business where we went to every store at least once a week, often every day, to merchandise and sell the inventory in. So we had a lot of people, right? Kind of a military organization. And Northern California was always a seller dweller when it came to uh, the 24 business units in Frito. And the performance, either financially or operational metrics, they just they had trouble um, performing for a number of years. So I said to the leader, who I, I uh, still keep in contact with to this day, I said, and I, and I knew him from my, from my uh, divisional role, I said, listen, we're going to spend two weeks thinking through what are the three initiatives that we're going to drive through the organization. Let's, I don't want I don't want an answer tomorrow and, and and too often the business had an answer today and a different answer next week and it was causing confusion I said let's just pick three and we'll debate which three those are with our team and then we're going to lock in and stay there and we picked the three ultimately um, two were top line driven operational metrics that we could measure one was um, uh, how how our team worked and coached the frontline salespeople and ultimately, after about three months, we were at the top of the list when they ranked the 24 business units on key performance measures, including uh, revenue growth, profit growth, share growth, and some other operational metrics that were unique to the business. 
And so we would get all these letters. This is pre-email, so I'm going back away. We get all these letters from people saying, what did you do? What's going on? And we would just have these three simple things. So I say all that to say it really helped me have that kind of moment where I said, it's not necessarily about how good the strategy is. Frankly, this, you know, they might have had three better ideas along the way, but because they changed the next uh, to the next thing too quickly, you couldn't get all those people aligned to execute it well. So it come, you know, it really has stuck with me, Jack, because I'm a big believer in if you have an A strategy but C execution, you're going to miss your numbers every time. But if you have a B, maybe a B plus strategy and A execution, you're generally going to beat your numbers every time. And that was just for me the 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 the, the most um, compelling and clearest uh, indicator of that. And and uh, the 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 leader and I, as I said, I still keep in contact with him, and he still refers back to that. Just how you know how good it was for him, how good it was for us to get that kind of focus. And I'm just a big fan of focus because I think. You can get scattered too quickly and 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 try to do everything and you end up doing nothing. And if you really pick the, those key things to focus on and drive them, I think good things can happen. Managing multiple spreadsheets, disconnected data, numbers you just can't trust. Your finance team can't be the strategic partner your organization needs right now with obstacles like that getting in your way. Venna can change that. Venna brings people, processes, and systems together in a single collaborative analytical platform so you can drive connected business planning and better decision making. And it's the only native Excel complete planning platform built for Microsoft 365 with Power BI embedded. With Venna, your financial and operational data is always connected and your teams are always armed with insights and time to focus on what matters most. So when the stakes are high and the margin for error low, plan with agility, plan with resilience, plan with Venna so you can be prepared for whatever comes next. Visit venasolutions.com slash planning aces to learn more about how Venna will help you plan for anything. Uh, we're going to jump what we refer to as our mentoring round. And forgive me, I'm running a little long here with my lines of questions as usual. But um, what we'd like to do is ask you to think back to that first time you stepped into a CFO role, which uh, uh, at Pepsi you had to, uh, uh, several high uh, senior finance roles, but I guess I'm thinking it was would have been at uh, Bath and Body Works. But anyway, you, you get to select. But the first time all that responsibility fell on your shoulders, if you could go back in time and give yourself that piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah, I think what I would probably say is um, to really think about the business leaders and getting to the answer quicker. I think, you know, initially I was, maybe explaining all the steps along the way. And um, it was interesting to me, not so interesting to them. <laughs> I think, you know, being able to just cut to the chase and give them the answer, I describe it as, you know, they want to know what time it is, not how the watch is made, right? And so I think sometimes, and I've, I've tried to coach that in my team to, you know, really um, take that approach. I'd say the other thing, and, and, and frankly, maybe more important, uh, but I just adopted it before the Bath and Body Works role. I always try, I, I think finance people, you know, to state the obvious, we don't sell anything, we don't make anything, we don't buy anything. Um, we influence people, right? And I think to do that, they have to know that you care about what they do, about the business, about our competitive landscape, et cetera. So I always challenge myself to know more about any function in the business than anyone else in the business except the leader of that function. And the reason is because we have to, in, we, I, my team would have to influence them to do something. And you can't really influence somebody if they don't think you know what they do. So that was always a challenge I had for myself and I still do today. The second challenge was to know more about to know more about the competition than anyone in the business. Because again, I go back to 
if you're spending 60 to 70 percent of your time on top line revenue related things then you got to know what the competition's doing and you're likely dealing with salespeople or marketing people or merchants in retail who um, are always thinking about the competition so to know what they're doing and to understand what they're doing just makes you better positioned to influence people so those two challenges um, were, were important to me, uh, as I said, before I got into retail at Bath and Body Works and I carried it forward and I and certainly, uh, you know, tried to instill that in my team. We like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side. We wonder if there's a personal habit or part of a daily routine that you're known for. This might be something a, a family member might point out to us rather than a a colleague at work, but anything come to mind when we ask for a personal habit or daily routine that over the years perhaps has kept you on a even keel? Yeah, so it's a it's a good one. I th- and I think even keel is an important thing. I think people want to look at finance leaders as as not being, you know, erratic or volatile or, you know, short fuses. So I, I'd like to think I'm I'm uh I'm a bit of an even keel. But I'd say, you know, personally Jack, I, I've in terms of habit, in terms of hobbies and things I like to do, I'm probably an inch deep and a mile wide over the years, you know, and I've just, whether it's travel or, um, uh, you know, photography or cooking or wine or, you know, salvage denim for that matter. I mean, I could talk about a number of things, not, not, not very, not very, uh, uh, in, in an expert fashion, but I know enough to be dangerous. And so what I, what I like about that is, it's a way for me to typically connect with somebody. So when I come into a new business or a new business unit and I meet the team and start to work with them, I try to find a way to connect with them. So it's not just about the business and you start to form a, a more personal relationship because you spend a lot of time at work working together and you got to, you ought to like what you're doing and who you're doing it with. And I found that that allows me to, you know, has allowed me to maybe to better connect with folks that I'm working with um, so that we can better balance the business at hand and also have a little fun talking about things that we have a shared interest in. Is there a book you'd recommend? It doesn't have to be a business book or something you've read recently. You know, the one that probably had the most influence on me hands down was seven habits of highly effective people. And I know I'm going back a long way, but kind of like the change, uh, change framework at PepsiCo, you know, things like begin with the end in mind have stuck with me. And that and Covey's whole notion of the urgent and the important, you know, and where you're spending your time. I, I still sort things that way. My I don't I don't think about him per se in the book, but just that notion that this just doesn't seem that important. We'll get to it later, or maybe somebody else can tackle it. Uh, I'm going to go work on these other things with the team that feel like bigger bigger leverage opportunities. So that one has always stuck with me. And the other one I like is Blue Ocean Strategy. You know, I think that notion of swimming in the red water with the sharks, trying to steal share from each other, that's kind of what we did, you know, and um, in, in consumer products and most people do in consumer products and other kinds of businesses. But that that idea of getting out into the blue water where there's no competition, really charting your own course, you know, that's what we do at Planet Fitness. And that's what's really exciting, I think. And that book, I, I, I remember reading it a number of years ago and thinking that would be really cool. And, you know, lo and behold, here I am at a place where we're swimming in the blue water. So it's really, it's really kind of neat. Okay. Well, we're up to our final question where we're going to ask you to look forward for us and identify your priorities over the next 12 months. What would those be? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, as I said, we're still not all the way through the pandemic. So we want to make sure that we don't take any, any big decisions, you know, too far, uh, too far ahead of schedule for lack of a better term. And, you know, we get asked this question a lot by our, our investors. We, we have um, fairly aggressively returned capital back to our share, uh, uh, return cash back to our shareholders in the form of buybacks. And as we sit here today, we've got a significant amount of cash on the balance sheet. And I think we just want to be very measured, very thoughtful as we think about, you know, rebuild, as, as we've talked about, we've rebuilt our membership, we've recovered, uh, but there's still a ways to go until this is in the rearview mirror. And I think we want to continue to keep that that uh, strong cash liquidity position until we're through the pandemic, and can, but be able to continue to invest in the membership growth activities I talked about earlier, and then decide what is the right way to return um, 
or, or what is the right way to allocate that capital going forward? And, you know, it may be some mixture of what we've done in the past and something different, but we're in discussions with our board to sort that out. But that's a big priority because, you know, as, as our, thankfully, as our business has rebounded, our stock price is at an all-time high and our investors are looking at that cash on the balance sheet saying, so what are you going to do with it? Um, and it's not burning a hole in our pocket, but we know we, we, we want to um, determine the best way to, to allocate that capital going forward. Tom Fitzgerald, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Well, thanks very much for having me, Jack. I sincerely enjoyed it. Hello, listeners. Do us a favor. Be certain to subscribe to CFO Thought Leader on Apple Podcasts, or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or Google Play. If you like the show, please recommend it to a friend. And on behalf of CFO Thought Leader, thank you for listening.